Hey, what's up? How's everyone doing? Man, I'm, I'm really excited to be back here. Um, as you said, my name is Sean Seguin, uh, and most of you already know me. Uh, but just a little bit about me. I've uh, been married for eight years to my wife, Kayla. She's in the back over there. If you want to look, she's waving from her chin in there. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, we have a daughter named Miette. She's three and a half, and a son named Gideon. He's one and a half. And we have one on the way. She's a little girl. We don't know her name yet. So we're really excited about this place we're in in our journey. We are in the process of preparing to plant a church in Austin, Texas. We've moved down there. We're kind of plugged in with a small church plant there. And we're learning and growing and going to be sent within two years or so. Um, and so I, I'm just excited about another opportunity to preach here, um, to come back and just Ryan and I have had a close friendship for a long time, and so it's always a special thing for him to hand the pulpit over and say, would you mind sharing? So it's awesome, and I'm glad I get to give him a break. Uh, but let's go ahead and pray real quick. God, thank you uh, for another opportunity to speak here. I just pray that uh, you would breathe upon my words, breathe upon our hearts, and that your conviction would fill us, and we would literally change our lives because of your gospel message. So convict our hearts and help us to move in, different, move in different directions in our lives, wherever we have strayed from where you've called us to. In your name we pray, amen. amen. Now, imagine with me, uh, you're searching for a house to buy. You, you tell your realtor all the things you're looking for in a house, and your realtor says, actually, I have the perfect house for you. Come and check it out. You go, you drive up, and you, you see the front of the house, and you go, this, this thing is beautiful. I, I, I can't, like, this is amazing. And, and so the realtor says, well, come on in. Let's go check it out. So we, you walk in the front door, and, and it's just so open. It's so open. It's perfect. There, I mean, it's just this big living room, and you go, oh, my gosh, this is the house. And you're looking around, and you, this is the house. I don't need to look any further. I'm signing the contract. You signed the contract after you, you looked at the first room, and then you went and you moved all your stuff in, but you move all your stuff into that front room, right? You, you go, okay, man, this is the room. Like, this is my beautiful, beautiful house, and you're so excited about it that you, you just decorate, you put your bed in there, you just use this one big entryway, and you love it, and it's amazing, and then you invite all your friends over, and you're like, check out my house, and you show them this front room, and you're like, isn't this incredible? And they're like, uh, what about the rest of the house? You're like, isn't it amazing? But I think when it comes to the gospel, many of us have focused so much on the entryway that we've missed the entirety of the gospel house. That the gospel is so much more than getting in. It's so much more than a personal relationship between me and Jesus. It's so much bigger than that. And so today we're going to be talking about the multifaceted gospel of Jesus Christ. We're going to talk about the, the multiple rooms that come with this gospel. The gospel is not only personal. We'll talk about that a bit. But it's also communal. It's also political. It's also ecological. These are the four facets, I believe, that the gospel brings to us. And it, I don't know, this was actually hard for me. I'm not doing this well, and I need to work on it. This, as I began to write this sermon, God has been convicting my own heart. So I hope that uh, you allow God to do the same to you. So first of all, the gospel is personal. This is what we all, I think, know very well. Uh, but if you have not heard the gospel, this is your chance to hear it. It's the, the Romans road, if you've not heard that. The Romans road is simply a bunch of verses out of Romans that explain why we need Jesus. First of all, we find that all have sinned. Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everybody has sinned. Second of all, our sin earned death. Romans 5, 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. So we all sinned. We all earned ourselves death. The good news, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8. But God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So even though we deserve death because we sinned, Christ took that death. And lastly, if we trust Jesus for his death, if we say yes to his death, we, we can be saved. Romans 10, 9 through 10. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with uh, the mouth one confesses and is saved. This is the personal gospel that I think most of us understand, grasp. It is, it is beautiful because it saves me from an eternity in hell. It saves you from an eternity in hell. It is personal because it's about you and God. It's about a restored relationship between you and your Father in heaven, and it offers you a lot of personal benefits. You get the Spirit of God who comes and dwells within you and empowers you. You, you, you gain a family. You get a lot out of this. It's a very personal experience for you. And it's good. It's good news for you individually. So what do we do with this? Accept the gospel, first of all. Accept Jesus' death for our sins. And then second of all, live in your new identity. Walk in the Holy Spirit. Realize that you are the hands and feet of righteousness on this earth. Live as the righteousness of God. Live in your new identity. But it's not, this isn't the end of it. This is just the first entryway into the household of the gospel. We, it's not just good news for me or just for you. It's not just personal you were not only made right with God, you were made right and made one with one another. This is a, a huge aspect of the gospel that actually, um, you know, a lot more of the traditional churches focus on the, the oneness of the people. Um, in our tradition, we find ourselves with the oneness with God. In other traditions, we're going to talk more about those. And I think we, all, we need all these facets. But the gospel is not only personal, it is communal. It is communal. Sin is did not simply divide my relationship with God, it broke the very first human relationship that ever existed. Sin destroys relationships. See, this is what we see in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve are in perfect unity, naked and unashamed. What's the very first thing when they take the bite of the fruit? All of a the sudden, they realize their nakedness and they hide. Self-protection begins to happen. Self-protection is the, the initial cl uh, clear signs of sin in our own lives. But second of all, they start blaming one another. Well, you got Adam, instead of, protect, instead of protecting his wife, which he should have done, and, and saying, you know what, I'm responsible, he begins to blame his wife. Again, self-protection. If it comes down between me and my wife, she's going down, not, not me. And isn't that, isn't that what we do? It's, it, I mean, this is, this is the first community in, in our life in, or in our world, and, and it's destroyed by sin, and it goes even further. Genesis 3, 16, God says to Eve, it, your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. Again, humanity, our, our, even the basest relationship of marriage is at a dan in danger because of sin. It's broken apart because of sin. So think about this. This is at a personal level. It's me over you. But think about this when you expand this to a clan. It's my group over your group. Or nation against nation. My nation over your nation. All of the sudden, war and racism and sexism becomes possible, be po possible because we care more about me and my clan and my group than anybody else. We lift ourselves up and create social hierarchies. And this, this is the reality of what sin has done to us. There's something called social identity theory, and, and when I uh, studied this a little bit, I, I found it really, really interesting. Um, there's these guys, uh, Henry Taf Tajfel and John Turner. Uh, back in 1979, they wrote an article, and they, 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 they were the first ones to propose this, this idea of social identity theory. And they explain uh, in their, their article, Social Identity Theory of Intergroup Behavior, um, if you don't like listening to academic stuff or you're like, I don't know what you're talking about, just hang on, we'll, I'll explain it a little bit more. But I think this is such a great quote. Tajfell and Turner write this, Social categorizations are conceived here as cognitive tools that segment, classify, and order the social environment and thus enable the, in the individual to undertake many forms of social action. But they do not merely systematize the social world. They also provide a system of orientation for self Reference. They create and define the individual's place in society. Social groups understood in this sense provide their members with an identification of themselves in social terms. These identifications are to a very large extent relational and comparative. 
They define the individual as similar to or different from, as better or worse than members of other groups. And while this, this theory is, 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 the idea is we latch onto a certain group because we identify with it and we feel like it feeds the identity that we think makes us superior to others. And we do, we do this. I, I mean, it goes to a very base level. It started in high school very clearly. Did you not go searching for the group that like matched your identity and made your identity above and beyond everybody else in the social ladder? How much did we all seek that out? For me, I sought out the, the hip hop crowd. I felt like this group of people were real, they were authentic, there was something like raw and gritty about it, I loved it, and I, and I found myself, it was like, I, I accepted the whole culture, I adopted, I, I started to wear the clothes, I started to speak the, the speak, uh, I started, I put lowrider posters all over my walls, I, I mean, like I, like, I loved the hip-hop culture, I began breakdancing, if you know me that long ago, you know that I used to breakdance, um, I became a part of this group and it, and it gave me a sense of self-worth and it made me feel like I wasn't like another one of those yuppies out there, those preps, those, you know, those geeks, those whatever, like I had my social classifications and this group gave me a sense of self-worth up here and if anybody had anything negative to say about my culture, my music, my clothing, my whatever, it was, it was us versus them. There is this, this sinful self-tendency that where sin comes in and it says my clan over your clan me over you and it ignores the imago dei the image of god on every human being the lines that divide us in these groups are not just it's not just something that we did something silly when we, that we did when we were in high school but it expands beyond that into racial lines that divide us and and gender lines that divide us, and uh, political lines that divide us. And we look at everybody who's not in our group, and we point fingers and talk about how, how horrible they are, and we start to feel superior about ourselves, and we forget the imago day in all humanity. And sin invades and destroys and breaks apart humanity, breaks apart society, and the communal aspect of the gospel is forgotten. But the reality is that in the church, through Jesus Christ, all humanity was made one. The Imago Dei was supposed to be most clearly seen and most clearly evident in the community of the church where we become one. That it doesn't matter what your race, what your social class, wherever you're at, that we can come together in Christ. And in fact, we see this um, in Galatians 3, 26. This was probably a very early uh, uh, baptism formula they would they would baptize and they would say this and this is interesting paul says this for in christ jesus you are all sons of god through faith for as many of you as were baptized into christ have put on christ there is neither jew nor greek there is neither slave nor free there is neither male and female for you are all one in christ jesus in jesus christ every dividing line that makes us forget about the imago day is destroyed you, like, do you get this? That the gospel is not about just me and Jesus getting our relationship right. It's about us getting our relationships right. It's about us restoring humanity in, in such a way that the kingdom of God becomes tangible. The gospel is the solution to racism, sexism, classism, oppression, subjugation, violence, and war. But what, what do we do practically? How do we handle this? What do I do with this? First of all, if you are a believer, it means you should be deeply ingrained in true community with other believers. That doesn't mean just come to church on Sunday. That means that we should be involved in, in community groups or action groups as we do them, as you do them here. Get deeply ingrained in the community and be willing to confess your sins to one another, to pray for one another, that we should be willing to, to lean on one another because we can't do it alone. Christ brought us together for a reason and often we ignore this, this communal dimension of the gospel and we just hang out with the me and Jesus thing. Hang out in, in the entryway of the gospel house, right? God wants so much more for us than that. But the gospel is not only personal and communal. Thirdly, it is political. It is political. 
Let me say this. Every human system and institution on this earth is broken by sin as well. There is no perfect system, no perfect institution here. I found this interesting. In 2015, uh, in, in Dallas, Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, uh, it was, it's, fi- it's just over, slightly over 50% white, white people. Um, but strangely, when it comes to low-income households, households under 38000 a year, only 17% of those kinds of households are purely white households. Strange, right? It seems like, like we are so much far, we're so far beyond all the racism in the past. Like, why isn't this inequality fixed? It's because there's a broken system. It's because there's a broken institution. And I know that we, like, as Christians, we like to focus on if we could just fix you people, then all this stuff will be fixed. But there are broken institutions, there are broken systems. There were laws that were created, you know, years ago that were racist, that pushed all the minorities into a small area and gave them less access to good education, gave them less access to good jobs, did not give them opportunities for land and owner, owning property. And, and then we go... Uh, well, they're, but they, they're all in this, you know, they grow up in this area and they have nothing to pass down to their children, nothing to hand over, and, and they're stuck in this junky system and, and we sadly can't help but to look at, see, like this, this, this is a sad reality. It should not be this way. There's a broken system, there's a broken institution, and it's not just racism, it's not just sexism, it's not just, it's not just the institution of the housing market, which played a major role in a lot of this. It's, it's not just the laws, it's not just the politics, it's, I mean, judicial systems, education systems, a lot of, all of these institutions play a role in this, and every human institution is imperfect. It falls short of the perfect system and institution that God desires to instate, which is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, when you talk about kingdom, that is political by nature. When you talk about a king being on the throne, that is political by nature. This is not about Republican versus Democrat or socialist versus democracy. You know, like this, this is not what this is about. Like God has a better institution than everything we can come up with in our mind. And it is with him on the throne ruling and with us as true citizens of his kingdom. And Jesus preaches the kingdom of God more than any other gospel. It's interesting. If you read uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you will find kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, the gospel of the kingdom of God, the gospel of the kingdom of heaven, over and over and over. And when they refer to the gospel, it's the good news about the kingdom. And yet we have the very personal gospel that we gained from Paul. He explains how do we get into the kingdom? How do we become citizens of this kingdom? But we focus very much on that personal aspect. But Jesus talked a lot about bringing his kingdom to this earth. That when he came, he began to inaugurate his kingdom. And at his death, he invites us to become citizens of a kingdom. So the gospel has a political reality. I mean, just listen to a few of these words. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You'll recognize these, I'm sure. Jesus was proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Blessed are the poor in the spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. You will never enter the kingdom. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Seek first the kingdom of God. These are just a few short little statements. 128 times just in the gospel in Acts alone do we see the word kingdom. The gospel is a political thing. It impacts us in a, in a very, is beyond personal and beyond communal. See, Jesus is not just creating a redeemed community. He is creating a Christ-centered kingdom. And he invites us to become citizens of that kingdom. And that means that when you become a Christian, you don't just become, you know, get your right relationship with God. All of a sudden, you function by a whole new system. Where God's system says that the poor need to be lifted up. When God's system says we need to fight against injustice, where God's system says we actually need to do something about the problems in this world and not be like, well, it's all going to go away one day and we'll end up in heaven and it'll be good, but actually care about the things that are going on in this earth. God cares about the things that are happening in this earth right now. God hates the racism that we see. God hates the sexism that we see. God hates the unjust institutions and he wants to set all things right and he wants to do it through his people as he builds his kingdom through us. 
That's the reality of this multidimensional gospel, that it goes beyond personal, goes beyond communal. It becomes political. And what do we do with this? I think we should begin to ask how we can be involved in the institutions and try to make change according to God's kingdom, being ambassadors of Christ here on this earth. How do, I mean, for a parent, get involved in your PTA and think, how can I help this educational system? How can I be involved in that? Go to town hall meetings. I don't know. I mean, there are lots of ways for us to get involved. Fight against unjust causes. Go, I mean, do something to make a difference. In, in, if you're a business owner, man, give, offer, offer fair prices and fair wages. And if you're a consumer, which we all are, don't participate in, in unjust systems. Don't give your money to, to places that are, are, are feeding off of the poor and destroying others. I say this, and, and I'm not saying that I'm doing it well. I, I di- I'm doing it poorly. And I've been, I've been actually, like I said, I, I, as I began to write this sermon, I was deeply convicted. But this is the reality that we are called to be citizens of, of, the, of this kingdom and live differently on this earth because of it. So the gospel is not only personal, not only communal, not only political, but it is lastly ecological. It is ecological. Now, first I want to show you this little picture. Can you put the, the next picture up? Um, this, this, so I did this little thing. It's a footprint calculator, an ecological footprint calculator. And when I filled out this test, it told me how many earths it would take if everybody lived like me. If everybody lived like me, it would take 2.6 earths to sur- uh, for all of us to survive. We don't have 2.6 Earths. That's just the reality of it. If everybody lived like me, um, May 19th of this year, we would have ran out of all the resources that can replenish in a single year. Like, the reality is that I'm doing very poorly with my ecological footprint. Like, I'm being very honest with you. So this is, this is the reality of, of how I've handled my life on this earth. Um, but the question is, why does this matter? How is the gospel ecological? First of all, in Genesis 1.28, God says uh, to Adam uh, and Eve, and he says, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Subdue the earth, have dominion over all creatures. Now, I think some people look at that and go, See, we just need to do whatever we want to everything. We just need to plant, 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 build, 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 kill, 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 eat, 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 do whatever we want, and get fatter and fatter and fatter. Like, that's how we tend to view it sometimes. That's how I have viewed it in the past, I'll be honest. But what does it mean to have dominion over something, have dominion over the animals? A good ruler doesn't just take, 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 take from its subjects, a good ruler offers life and flourishing. So when we're told to be, have dominion over the animals, we're told to care for the animals in a very legitimate sense. And not only that, but we're told to subdue the land. What does that mean? Well, Genesis 2.15, we get a clearer picture of that. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. That's what subduing means, to work and to keep. What does work and keep mean? In the Hebrew, we find this, these same two Hebrew words side by side um, in uh, Numbers 3, 7 through 8 to describe the work that the priests were supposed to do in the tabernacle. Adam was supposed to do the same work for this earth that the priests were supposed to do for the tabernacle. God cares about the place, the sanctity and the holiness of the place. And we as as humans were called to care for, to work and keep the place. That's a huge calling. And so God cares about this stuff. But, but, I mean, if that's not enough evidence for you, we've got a whole lot of scripture. Hopefully uh, I don't bore you all to death. But um, we see that, not only that, but we see that in in, uh, Genesis uh, 3, when we sin, what is what is harm beside not just our relationships with one another but our relationship with the land is hurt thorns and thistles begin to grow because adam sinned 
Sin hurts the land somehow. It's very mysterious. And in fact, we see that uh, again and again um, in Leviticus 18, verses 24 through 25. It says, Do not make yourselves unclean by any of these things. For by all of these, the nations I am driving out before you have become unclean, and the land became unclean, so that I punished its iniquity, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. So mysteriously, sin impacts the land. And in the prophets, we see land becoming defiled and land becoming unclean because of the sins of the people. So strange. But God genuinely cares about the land. In Deuteronomy 11, 11 through 12, it says this, But the land that you are going over to possess is a land of hills and valleys which drinks the water by the rain from heaven and the land that, your lo- that the Lord your God cares for. The eyes of the Lord your God are always upon it from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. God cares about the land. Interestingly, also Leviticus 25, 4 mentions this idea of the land receiving a Sabbath. Did you know that the land is supposed to get a Sabbath? Not just me and you. The land's supposed to get a Sabbath. We're supposed to not plant for an entire year in in the areas that we've planted in. Like, that's, that's how God set up this thing. And then... We also find that God doesn't just care about the land, but God cares about the creatures, the animals, as he said, to give, have dominion. But he also said, he has uh, Noah take all the creatures and save them all. He cares about the animals. He, he, tre- he creates laws uh, to take care of the animals. Do not muzzle the ox while it treads out the grain, right? Don't let the, let the ox actually graze while he eats. Take care of, love your ox, care for your ox while it cares for you. And the the Sabbath wasn't only for me and you and the land, but it was also for the animals. Deuteronomy 5.14. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your sons or your daughters or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. God wants our animals to find rest. God wants our land to find rest. God cares about his creation. Colossians 1, 19 through 20 says this. Colossians 1, 19 through 20 says, For in him all the fullness, this is Christ, for in Christ all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven making peace by the blood of his cross. The cross does not only make peace for me and you, it makes peace for all things, whether in earth or in heaven. This is incredible. The cross actually does something for creation. And then Romans 8, 19 says, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. All of creation is excited about the renewal of us as the people of God, because what that means is that one day creation will no longer have thorns and thistles and no longer have the, the, broken, the brokenness of sin infesting the grounds. It's mysterious. I don't understand it, but somehow it happens and God cares about the ground. God cares about the animals. And in Isaiah 11, 6 through 9, Isaiah gives us this picture of what it will look like when the kingdom of heaven comes, when, when everything is set right. The prophet says this, The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, and their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. When the knowledge of the Lord fills the earth, lions are going to eat straw, I guess. I didn't, like, this is so strange and so mysterious, and yet it seems that they will not hurt or destroy because the knowledge of the Lord will be complete. It'll be as if we go back to the Garden of Eden. There seems to be this sense that, that once there is peace amongst all of creation, this is, where God is, this is what God is aiming towards, peace for all of creation. So the gospel is not simply me, you, and, and us, and the kingdom. It is ecological as well. How do we participate in this ecological dimension? First of all, live a life of worship. Creation's waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. 
Sin impacts the ground somehow. <laughs> but second of all, look for ways to reduce your ecological footprint. I'm not saying that we're all going to destroy the earth, blah, 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 blah. I'm, care for the earth. That's all I'm saying. Love what God loves. Love the animals. Care for the animals. God is calling us to this. You know what? Grow a garden in your backyard. That's, that's something that could be cool. Pull some weeds. Get connected with the earth. Get your hands dirty in some soil. Um, and promote proper uh, treatment of all creatures. The gospel is deeply personal. And, it's without, and, and without its personal nature, the rest would be impossible. So I think the entryway is extremely important. You don't get in without the personal but once you're in, you become citizens of a kingdom. You become part of a family. You become deeply connected to more than just you and God. You have a household of gospel reality that exists. I want to close with this. Listen to the lyrics of this. Uh, it's a famous Christmas hymn by Isaac Watts, Joy to the World. It says this, Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room, and heaven and nature sing. There is a kingdom reality, and there is a personal reality. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ, while fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy, all of creation singing out to God. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow, far as the curse is found. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love. The gospel is so big and so great. It is good news, not just for you and me, but all of creation. Man, we are so, so blessed to be part of this kingdom, so blessed to be part of this community, so blessed to be invited into this relationship with our creator Enjoy the whole household of the kingdom of God. The gospel doesn't just beckon us to live as children of God, but as Christ-centered family, as citizens and ambassadors of a just kingdom, and priests and caretakers over all of creation. Let's do that. Think of a way that we can start to do things differently this, way, this week. I'm being convicted to do some things. I don't want to share publicly because I don't want you guys to feel like you need to do what I'm doing. Um, but if you want to talk to me, that's fine. But... Um, I'm, I'm thinking about changes that I need to make in the way that I live and things that I need to start doing because this has genuinely convicted my heart. Um, so I invite you guys to think about ways that you can glorify God more fully in every aspect of the gospel, in your personal relationship, in community, in, in the political realm of the kingdom of God, and, and also in the ecological way. How can, how can you do things to, to even maybe just reduce your ecological footprint? Let's go ahead and pray and close out. Thank you. God, we thank you so much for the good news of the gospel that you offer. It is so much bigger than just me and you. God, you offer a full household. You offer something so great. Let us explore every room of this house. Let us live as ambassadors of your kingdom on this earth. Enable us to walk like you've called us to walk. Enable us to be the children of God you've called us to be, to live in our identity and walk it out to be all that you've called us to be. God, thank you that your good news is not just for me, but it's, it's for all of creation. Thank you for what you offer us in the gospel. In your name we pray. Amen.